Okay, well, I'll get us started then. Sure. Okay, well, good afternoon and welcome everyone um, to the talk by Andrei Matic from the European Parliament's uh, office, liaison office here in DC. I'm Francesca Bignami and I'm a professor of EU law at GW and I'll be moderating. It's really an honor and pleasure to welcome Andre and I was told I can, should call him Andre so I will uh, to GW in this virtual format. And he will be speaking on the EU and the new US administration. Andre has been a member of the European Parliament's legal service since 2005, uh, where he advises on legal proceedings, legislative proceedings, and he represents the Parliament in court. And he's now here in DC for a stint um, in the, as a legal advisor in the European Parliament's liaison office. He is Slovenian by nationality, and he holds two law degrees from University of Ljubljana, an LLM from Yale Law School, and he holds a doctorate from Maastricht University. Uh, his book, Just Words, The Effectiveness of Civil Justice in European Human Rights Jurisprudence, was published in 2020 by Cambridge University Press, and you can find it online through Burns Law Library. And I very much recommend that you read it. It is a really wonderful summary and analysis and somewhat critical analysis of the Court of Human Rights uh, jurisprudence on the right to a fair trial. But we'll set that aside for the moment because that's not the topic of our uh, conversation here today. And so a couple just uh, words on how we'll be proceeding here. Uh, Andre will be speaking for about one ha half hour on the key issues on the current EU US agenda. And then um, we'll be taking questions and please do post your questions to the chat box here. I will be reading them um, so that he can respond to them and we can get to as many of the questions as you have. And he said he's very happy to take questions on any items of interest on the current EU US agenda. So feel free to raise questions that are of interest to you. And so uh, a very, very well, warm, warm welcome to, and uh, we very much look forward to your comments and the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much, Francesca. This is most kind. Uh, I, I'm always, uh, I stay always a bit, uh, how shall I say, in awe of this, <laughs> of, of, the, of the discussions with audiences in the US because it's such a, how shall I say, such a special place and also so, uh, how should I say, in, in terms of both academics and politics, I think it's probably the most vibrant and the most brilliant, I would say, uh, place on earth to discuss issues of public policy. Uh, that's sort of my, my always been my main interest. Um, indeed, I'm, I'm a lawyer with the European Parliament now for many, many years, um, uh, technically called member of the legal service, which means that I essentially represent Parliament in procedures uh, in, in front of the Court of Justice. And I also advise Parliament in uh, discussions with the Council and the Commission on legislative proposals. Um, I've now been posted to Washington. I'm, I'm really glad to be here to kind of follow the political events, but more importantly, also to discuss and to engage with the US public on the ma matters of common concern and questions that concern both the European Union and the US. And I think that's the, uh, I think it's uh, very much a value in itself. Uh, I think the, on many, many issues of, um, that concern the whole world today, the, the relationship between the US and the EU is probably the most important one. Uh, it's the biggest economic area, the most important trading relationship, the most important security relationship. So I think very, very important that we sort of use every opportunity to try to not just to explain to each other, you know, where we come from, what our views are, but also to try to kind of really discuss things which are not necessarily homogeneous, you know, in terms of political orientation and one or the other side. So I thought what, what I wanted to do is perhaps say a few words about where we are, maybe discuss some of the topics which are perhaps at the top of the agenda now uh, in 2021 um, in um, terms of the future relationship between the US and the EU. And I focus maybe on issues which are perhaps interesting from the legal perspective. So there's lots of things which are economic, political, even security, but I'm interested mainly in the questions of regulation of trade and human rights. So the areas that I've actually covered over the many years in Brussels. 
uh, maybe uh, to start in a very, very general sense. So there are issues that concern all of us and are more or less independent. So issues like climate change, for instance, or issues of um, the um, um, COVID uh, uh, crisis and economic recovery after it, uh, that, that's the main political issues today, both in the US and in Europe. But we deal with them essentially independently. They don't have a lot to do with exchange information. We, there is obviously vaccine issue, but they essentially are independent. We agree on the multilateral framework. We're very happy to see that the new administration has now uh, has decided to rejoin the Paris Accords. Um, but that's not, that's a multilateral issue. However, there are a number of issues that where the Union and the US uh, actually should work together or are very much depend on each other. And I'll go maybe through each one of them and then I'll be happy to take questions. I'm really anxious also to hear what you might be interested in. So the, perhaps the, 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 the most obvious one is the questions of trade. Um, as you know, uh, over the, the past few years, the, the trade has been a particularly difficult uh, issue. Um, not just in, especially in the US, but also on the European side. Um, well, several years ago, there has been a major attempt to try to join the two economies together in a, in a common trade framework called the TTIP or the Transatlantic uh, Partnership. Uh, that negotiation has been, has been stopped. It seemed that there was too many uh, open questions, too many divergences. Um, and uh, there's been, a, a, a lately has been, a, last year has been a proposal, a mini mini deal on lobsters that has been a small step ahead. But uh, in general terms, I think that's an area where now will be again the time to try to explain what, explore the possibilities um, to see where, the, where, where you know, mutual interests might be found. Um, more specifically on the question of, for example, multilateral arrangements, the WTO is a major issue because that's an area where for example, there's been the long-standing dispute on the subsidies for the Boeing and Airbus companies. And as a matter of fact, that doesn't seem to be, uh, it seems to be rather static at this point in the sense that the, 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 the attempts to try to resolve both the US and the EU have imposed tariffs authorized by the WTO to, to, uh, as, as a retaliation for the, for the subsidies. Uh, the last round, I think, was actually even December still under the Trump administration. But I think there is common interest, and certainly in the EU, to try to solve this issue by way of common negotiation. That just doesn't make sense to have sort of tit for tat exchanges, you know, of uh, of, of tariffs rather than you know, let's say one common one, one common approach, one common agreement. Since both both parties are entitled to do so, um, then there is perhaps the more interesting, <clears throat> certainly for lawyers, the issue of the WTO appellate body. And now that's an area where the US has had a particularly strong views um, over the past years. As a matter of fact, the, the appellate body, which is the, the main, uh, the ultimate decision maker in terms of legal disputes uh, in Geneva, has not been able to function because it doesn't have the number of uh, uh, appointed um, uh, members or arbitrators. Um, the, the US has particularly strong reactions to the way that body has been adopting decisions and has a whole series of, let's say, legal objections in terms of overreach and, and having to, you know, um, adopting interpretation that uh, allegedly allegedly go beyond the dam mandate or the, the, the using its own uh, cases as precedents. Now, I, I've actually done a legal opinion on that. I, I don't agree with those assessments. It seems to me that um, some of them, or at least much of the, even much of the criticism actually might be based on the distance between common law and civil law understanding of what, you know, what is the proper for decisional body to do. Because for us as, as a civil lawyer, it's quite normal for me, for example, to for an appellate body to review questions of fact, or it's quite normal for me for the you know for 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 an appellate body to adopt extensive interpretation of what it should do and to kind of align the rules that are to to the to the needs of the case to make a fair and just outcome. So maybe I think this would be a very interesting area where we're looking forward to try to see how this problem can be solved so that we have actually a body that can solve disputes. And it's, this is very much the European Union, the European Parliament position that we should have you know, multilateral systems and that we should have you know, court or let's say judicial or arbitral, whatever um, dispute uh, solution uh, mechanism that could you know, solve any divergences in opinion. So that's a very, very important area that's gonna be very topical in this, in, in this forthcoming months. Um, then there is, for example, another area where that might interest again, uh, both sides. So the, we will both work now a lot on the question of the rule of law uh, and how to enforce the rule of law. And on the side of the union, perhaps it might interest you, there is this big discussion of the rule of law internally 
and it has been for several years now. So the, um, you, you know, the rule of law has traditionally been conceived in, in terms of national constitutional regimes as a kind of a general principle, and it, it's both in civil law countries and in, in common law countries. Uh, but over the last few years, <clears throat> the, the union has made a number of efforts to try to integrate it in its own sort of um, um, institutional architecture. There are a number of mechanisms that have been adopted. So there is a rule of law mechanism now, which involves a dialogue between the commission and the member states over a variety of areas, notably on judicial independence and the quality of the justice system, but also on media pluralism or even on corruption. Then there is the um, uh, there is sort of a rule of law framework, which kind of is supposed to be used to try to see if there should be sort of a major proceeding under the so-called Article Seven of the treaty um, uh, to um, declare a breach of the value of the rule of law or democracy or human rights. Um, there has been most recently there's been actually a major attempt to try to make sure that in terms of union budget funding that funds are processed and used in accordance with rule of law principles. And for that, and that, that exactly has been also not just the demand of many member states, but also the European Parliament to try to, and have, in fact, there has been a regulation adopted just now in December, it's entering the force and it, it allows uh, the commission some way of supervision of, you know, what the situation, especially with judicial independence and others and administrative bodies is so that when, when funds are used and the way they are um, uh, let's say uh, applied uh, the way the mechanisms are applied can, uh, uh, can should be uh, compliant uh, with with general you know uh, rule of law and uh, let's say fair impartial administration principles. That's been a, so that's that's the the effort that has been done within the union. But then we also have the effort to protect rule of law and human rights internationally. And again, we have an interesting development last year. The the, the union adopted its own version of the Magnitsky Act which actually has been inspired by the U.S. Magnitsky Act. So the U.S. has one in, uh, if, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, from, from 2012 and then mandated in 2016 uh, with, the, with the list of persons uh, for, 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 uh, whose assets are frozen. And we now have actually an instrument like this also in the union. So there's a general framework, which will, especially for grave and serious violation of human rights, um, uh, will uh, make it possible to uh, for the union and the council uh, to impose restrictive measures. Essentially, those are the freezing of funds and then the travel bans. And the idea there is that we'll have a more systemic overview of even where there are human rights violations worldwide, um, that, that the union can essentially uh, um, enact and at least prevent the union its own economic system being used by persons who have committed, for example, human rights violations. And, uh, and that, of course, is very, very topical now. Uh, you, uh, I guess you all follow the news with, with the uh, story of Mr. Navalny and, and, and the general situation that uh, in Russia, which is a particular problem. Uh, but but the, the, the instrument is supposed to be applied globally. So that's, the, it does not particularly target uh, just Russia. It's supposed to target all countries. So that's another area where, again, obviously we need to have, it's, it's good to have a common discussion to have, you know, if there is, for example, a global problem with human rights, obviously the, it's, it's good that the union and the, uh, and the, and the US uh, act together and essentially have at least comparable, perhaps sanctions in place so that, you know, the, you know there is the, the maximum effect is given to this, uh, um, that's it, to these objectives. And then perhaps um, maybe the, the third point, and maybe I'll just go to the kind of the main topic that, that we have, I think, before us just now, today. Uh, and that's the question of uh, the common regulation, especially regulation of digital space. That's been, again, a major issue for quite a while, um, being both discussed again in the US and the EU. And again, that is because of the, this is not even a question of cooperating as in questions of trade, but it literally is a question of regulating a single digital space. So here we just cannot do, almost cannot do other, other than find some kind of at least comparable solutions on both sides and try to see how to, how to make sure. And we know that, and for example, on the issue of data privacy, data protection, that's been a major concern in the, in the for EU US relations. Uh, you have last year, uh, there the has been the, the very famous Schrems II decision by the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, which has invalidated the, the privacy shield, has made it much more difficult for the companies to transfer uh, data from Europe to the US on, on grounds on, on for reasons of mass surveillance. And there are now discussions going on how to solve that problem. 
Uh, but that is just one example of you know how one regulates the common common digital space and economic area, which is you know common, which is one. There's no two, there's no two different markets. That's one market. So I, I wanted to talk a bit more about these two proposals that we have now in the union. We're just going ahead. However, I should note that there is a lot of inspiration has been taken by the recent work done in Congress. The Congress, uh, the U.S. Congress, has done a major investigation into the the, the major um, 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 digital companies. Last year, it has published has published the, the House so the, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust. Uh, the majority has published a report uh, the, under the auspices of Chair Cicely. Uh, it's a very ex uh, extensive report, and uh, that's been very much looked into um, uh, in Brussels as well. Uh, in fact, as a matter of fact, the Commission has participated in the hearings that that gave rise to this report. So there's been a lot of interaction already at this stage. However, we now have actual legislative proposals now in the Union. I'll, I'll say something about those, and, and I'll be happy to, to perhaps answer your questions. They're literally here in front of me. So there is, there is one here. This one is called the, digit, the Proposal for a Digital Markets Act. And this is essentially a proposal for an, for an instrument that would regulate the issue of competition or antitrust, as you would call it in the US. And the idea here is that it tries to complement the usual uh, competition enforcement proceedings. Now, there have been some competition proceedings, as a matter of fact, against the digital giants in Europe as well. Um, but the idea here is that it's been considered that's a bit uh, insufficient. And now the idea is to complement this with sort of a general administrative framework that is going to uh, principally target uh, what I refer to as gatekeepers. So especially major online platforms that, that interact, that, that facilitate an exchange with, essentially between, you know, buyers and sellers and uh, recipients of services and, 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 and users of, uh, of these um, uh, digital services. Um, I'm looking at here it now. So there is a there is a general, rather general architecture that's foreseen, and it, which tries to force these digital giants, in particular, to comply with certain basic fair competition principles. In particular, not to engage, for example, in self-preferencing, so to, to to use to kind of advantage its own products on on the on its own platform or to, uh, that it has to allow, for example, for some level of interoperability so that you know, the users can change from one to the other, or it has to allow the, 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 um, let's say the sellers to, to sell independently. Um, there's a whole list of uh, criteria in articles five and six, and I'll be happy to go through them, but the main idea is that you should not have any kind of uh, privileged position or unfair or dominant position as a digital platform when you are uh, when you're operating this market. And there is the idea for the commission to be constantly involved as a kind of a supervisory body and to be able even in extreme cases to uh, pronounce sanctions, to investigate the market situation and even sanction. There's a 10% of the annual turnout is a possible fine as the, as the as last resort. But in principle, the idea is should, should be sort of a certain degree of self-regulation in conjunction with the commission. And, and that is that is sort of the, the, the first, I would say, instrument. And perhaps I can say more about it uh, in more detail under QA. But then say at the end, say something about the Digital Services Act. And this is the other proposal that I have here. This is again another instrument proposed um, by the Commission. The idea here is that this should sort of provide a more general union-wide framework for um, regulating um, online content in particular to prevent the um, illegal content on, on, on the internet. That's the main, that's the main objective. Um, the, and and it, it, the idea is to protect both sides. So the idea is that it, at the same time, it's going to provide, uh, it provides for the exemption of liability for, let's say, for the, for the online platforms if they do not know when, what, when, when, uh, illegal, when content is illegal. But then there's also a notice and action mechanism. So the idea is that any user will be able to, to flag or to alert the, the, the um, internet uh, providers uh, to that there is illegal contact. And after that, there, there might be questions of liability. At the same time, it also provides for the possibility of um, a fair address and turn complaint for users. So for example, if your account is deleted, if your content is taken down, you should have the right for some out of court settlement procedure and to have a remedy. There are then more compl complex obligations for the really big giants, which should be having to do risk assessment and risk mitigation, in particular to what might be actually not illegal, but harmful contact. There is actual mention of disinformation of public discourse um, and et cetera. 
So there's a rather comprehensive idea, again, being supervised by the commission and by the special bodies that are going to be established in each of the member states. And the idea is that we have a general framework that is going to allow to have a single European, let's say, uh, regulation. I mean, the, the, I should clarify the concept of what's illegal. Illegal is not regulated in the, in the, in the proposal. That's still on the, mainly on the level of member states. But this will be sort of a general framework. And these are the starting points. So both proposals are not the starting points. They're now commission proposals. That means that it's, going to, it's now going to the Council of Ministers and to the European Parliament. And it's starting, there's going to be a public debate. Um, there's going to be a lot of political interest in it. And both of those, the, the Internal Market uh, Committee has, uh, has been given competence for this. Uh, so I expect that this, this will certainly take at least a year, probably two, maybe more, a uh, very, very extensive discussion. And of course, the situation in the US will be very much always looked at. Uh, we, as I understand, the, the, the new administration and then Congress will also be looking at this at some point. So it's going to be very interesting to see how we, you know, how we, how we try to um, regulate the, the, this, this, this um, highly uh, contentious issue as well, because obviously the question of whether you can delete a, it's an account by a major company, that's a, obviously, you know, it's a private decision, but it's also a question of public interest. So maybe let me stop here. Uh, I don't know uh, how much time I spent. Uh, maybe it's best that we remain. Maybe uh, something. No, let's just stay here and maybe I'll go. Let's go to questions. So they are be happy to go into much more detail. These are very very technical things. So it really depends on what you're interested in um, on how we go forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. sure. <laughs> And uh, it's very, very interesting roundup of the issues that are currently on the table. Um, so I'm, everybody should feel free to enter their questions into the chat function. Um, and then I will, I will, I can read them from the chat function. I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. Uh, I see that there's a hand, but if, it, it would be easier, I think, if you can just uh, type it briefly and uh, I, will, I will record and speak. But while we're waiting, let me ask you a question, Andre, on um, what you last you left off with, which was the Digital Services Act and, right. and the proposal, right? So the first thing that comes to mind, of course, it's extraordinarily topical. And, um, and but the first thing that and the first thing that comes to mind from somebody who's worked on these privacy issues for many years now, is how um, you know, illegal illegal is going to be defined. And mm -hmm. the, the problem, it seems to me, is that, as you said, the digital market is not a space that's defined by national borders. So to leave the definition of legal and illegal to the member states seems to be inherently problematic because um, you know, each of the member states is if, for instance, if extreme speech is seen to be illegal, right, uh, then there are ramifications for other countries. If, and so, you know, and, the, and a country that says it's illegal um, will want to make sure that the illegal speech isn't coming in from platforms in other countries in the member states. And of course, elsewhere, too, where many of these platforms have their um, place of business and host the information. Mm -hmm. So how is, what's the plan on how to deal with that? Because of course, extreme speech is the main point of difference within the EU. And it's the main point of difference between the EU and the US, even though US, of course, because of the events of January 6, because of the dangers of domestic um, extreme right terrorism, has come to some extent to start reappraising its view on extreme speech. So any thoughts on that? And then we'll go to questions from the yeah, audience. Thanks. It, it's just that um, I think you go really to the essence of the uh, issue. Again, the uh, there are some there are a number of, of issues, I mean, illegality comes, I think in the, there's a few main areas where this is. Obviously the question of terrorism, possible incitement of terrorism, hate speech. Uh, then there is possible, you know, um, abuse of minors. Then there is, we have the uh, intellectual property rights, etc. So uh, many of these things actually do differ quite a lot from one member state to another. There is also European regulation of some of those, of some of those um, uh, questions. So uh, largely now, I think this is very much also a question of the, the member state competence. It's, it's a divided both in the union and the member states we define. 
But indeed, it's a question how we're going to, what you pose is the problem is actually, I would say that the main problem, how does one regulate, you know, things which, you know, coming from another country. As a matter of fact, I recall just seeing a news item somewhere saying that the um, Italian authority has a request that has requested some kind of uh, blocking or some kind of removal, uh, even where the, uh, the actual authority that has jurisdiction was in, uh, in another member state. So this will again be the, um, the, I think part of the proposal is also to try to have coordination. There's gonna be an authority, assigned authority in each of the member states and indeed very much the coordination. For example, there's going to be an exchange of information on the court orders. So the, the main, let's say the, the strongest uh, practical uh, enforcement of the uh, regulation will be by the national administrative or judicial authorities that will be able to just say, you know, take this down for instance. And there's a system where this is going to be exchanged. So there is as much coordination uh, and, and harmonization possible. However, uh, I think it's very difficult, it will be very difficult at this stage already to, uh, I think it will be very difficult to have, let's say, to, to harmonize uh, this question of illegality because it's just, there's, you know, they're just quite different. Huh? So uh, it's, um, I think it's a major issue that's going, certainly going to be discussed, I think, as we go into the public debate. Um, but it's one appears in any way. Again, we're going to have also the same problem between the Union and the US. Um, you know, I've heard this um, several times. So the, for example, general approach to free speech or First Amendment rights, as, it's, uh, as they're known in the US, obviously is much more absolute than the free expression, for example, as defined in, the, in Europe and especially under the European Convention of Human Rights. There are actually quite important differences. Um, and then again, we're going to have to see, you know, when, when something is accessible in Europe, well, it will have to be, have to comply with the, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, with the European, uh, European standards. That is the, that's exactly, I think, the name of the game now. So that's why we really look forward to kind of exchanging also to see with Congress where Congress is going to go on this. Uh, and uh, also it will be interesting to see where the member states, uh, the European member states will have, I think, a very strong role to play with, again, with very divergent views. So it's an open question. My, my answer is simply that it, the, the question remains open and we'll see in the next year how it goes. Thank you. Well, on that um, note, there's a question here from Luis Maya Guerrero uh, the, about the gender perspective in, uh, in the proposal of the Digital Services Act, whether right. there's actual specific attention to um, violence against women and other kinds of a gender-based illegality that occurs on the through the web. Yeah, well, let me just read the, um, the, the definition right here in Article 2. So it says, legal content means any information which in itself or by its reference to an activity, including the sale of products or provisions of services, which is not compatible with union law or the law of a member state, irrespective of the precise subject matter or nature of that law. So it's a rather general, uh, understanding of what might constitute illegality. And the, obviously, I think the, uh, uh, there are a number of areas that uh, obviously concern women in particular, the most important being the, let's say, the abuse of minors or, or various form of, let's say, uh, abuse of images, uh, uh, illegal content of that kind, that, uh, that's what comes to mind immediately. Um, but the definition is comprehensive. The idea is really to try to have it, you know, have it, um, as many different viewpoints on this as are possible and then member states with individuals define what they think is, basic, is basically permitted or not permitted. Very interesting. And so working our way backwards, actually, let's work back from the commission proposal on the Di Digital Services Act to SHREMS and the uh, SHREMS 2 decision and the future of privacy shield. So what do you think in this new administration, will we get another privacy shield that hopefully will do a better job of assuaging some of the concerns mm -hmm. about um, overbroad surveillance that you know is designed to escape the US regulatory framework by essentially targeting third country nationals who don't mm -hmm. have the privacy rights that mm -hmm. domestic nationals have. So mm -hmm. is there gonna, is there room for progress in that, or is it? Are we just stuck with two different, you know, two different it's a, systems? It's a, it's a very good question. I think it's a very good question. Um, I, I, I don't know to what extent the new administration will be more open to, um, let's say, the European perspective on this. Again, this this uh, 
there is a lot of historical context here. I mean, there have been the questions of, you know, information sharing has been highly contentious um, for almost two decades now. And I remember because I worked on this um, more than 10 years ago in the context of PNR agreements. And the European Parliament actually had a particular role to play. It struck down the PNR agreement because it essentially refused the, uh, it thought it was, you know, just unacceptable that there would be sort of mechanism requiring mass transfers of data that could be analyzed indiscriminately. Um, and this has been, you know, a problem for, for a long time now. Uh, it, preceded the current, it preceded even the, the previous US administration. Uh, it had no particular, even in the, you know, irrespective of which party was in Congress or in the presidency. So uh, the, that poses a bit of a problem. And I'm, I'm confident that uh, now with the, uh, with the new administration, perhaps they're going to be a bit more opening to, to try to perhaps understand to a greater extent that the European perspective for historical reasons especially is different. There is a reason why data protection exists uh, in a number of European countries. It's essentially considered really one of the more important fundamental rights. And there is a really strong sensitivity. Uh, uh, there is, you know, as in other areas, there is the, you know, also the attitudes to free speech or the attitudes towards, you know, protection of personal dignity and so on are, are different. Uh, the, the, there has been, you know, that for very much of the post-war period, uh, post-Second War period, has been devoted to try to um, internationalize and to, to ground some of the basis protection of the human individual in, in every way of life. We have a human rights convention, uh, we have a court in Strasbourg, which again is without peril in the world. Uh, we have the Data Protection Convention in the Council of Europe. Um, there has been work on, on that point. There's been a directive, the, the, uh, a directive which again was uh, 20 years old before the, the current GDPR um, entered into force. So there is this is actually a, a right or let's say an issue that, that I think for many Europeans is really absolutely fundamental. And we're really hoping that I mean, the Parliament has actually reiterated on many, many occasions that it really wishes to see an arrangement that would be kind of respectful of that. And now the, the mass surveillance, the surveillance of the kind that's been uh, authorized under US law, that is, you know, that is, uh, one understands, of course, that there's a different US perspective also for its different role and then its different position in the world. But I think there has to be some scope for, uh, for, for future discussion. I, and as I understand, there have been actually negotiations going on post trims uh, I think the second semester of last year, I don't know where they are. That's an, it's, it's not Parliament. Um, it's actually been the Commission that's been engaging with the US administration. But it's definitely, I think, a topic that we'll have to watch. Uh, I think probably one of the most interesting things, because again, it's fundamentally of, of not just a, of, of it's a, one of the major commercial problems as well. Uh, the, the main digital giants being based in the US. Uh, it, it really it concerns everybody. This is really not, again, it's not about the EU as, as opposed to the US. It's essentially an issue that concerns everybody. So uh, I look forward to, 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 to seeing basically what would be the possible. I think it should be, po I think, I think it should be possible with the effort, but okay. I don't know. Well, so what do you think about the US pushback sometimes that this is a, somewhat, the EU is somewhat hypocritical because in the surveillance domain, domestically countries like the UK and France allow for very extensive surveillance of their own nationals. Mm -hmm. And we saw two cases being decided in the mm -hmm. fall, which essentially yes. confirmed this very extensive surveillance uh, power that secret services have within the member states in France and the mm -hmm. UK. And so allow for massive collection of information on people who are using communications network without much of anything prior to collecting that. Um, mm -hmm. So without limiting the scope for collection. Wait, do you want to comment on those two cases? I think you, or do you want to, to comment on this notion that uh, that the EU, EU is somewhat hypocritical and that it allows for a lot of uh, surveillance domestically, but um, it opposes it when it happens in the US? Yes, yeah. well, I think it's, uh, well, one can always find a contradiction or you can find the differences approaches in, in, in um, in almost any area uh, when it comes to you know internal regulation or you know external relationships i wouldn't say it's a it's a, it's a hypocrisy it's, i mean that's different it's within the, the, the member states 
Um, and again, it's not the, the issue here is essentially the, the enormous amount is the, the tra it's, it's not as if the and the shrimps, the, the, it's not as if the, you know, the, 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 the idea is that there should be no transfer of data. It's just that the size of the, you know, the, the role that, let's say, the digital transfers have today, again, is just something unique. I mean, the, the, the amount of data that goes, for example, from Europe to the U.S. Uh, is just astonishing. So we're talking completely different, you know, scale issues here. It's not as if, you know, uh, and it's again, the, 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 the situation that we have in, in the sense that uh, there are, for example, the autom automation and the, all the, the tools that exist now, which allow for this, uh, you know, surveillance to take place is, is just absolutely astonishing. So, I mean, now you have all seen the, you know, the, uh, the, the Netflix documentary on this, just recently on how much we can be supervised uh, just by using any kind of computer. So there is a bit of, a, I would say, I very much understand that for many people, this is a, it's a really major problem, but I don't think, I mean, I, I know there has been discussions and, and there have been people who have made this criticism, um, but I don't think it's a, I think it's, it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, so I, I don't have here before me the, the exact details, but it's not, I don't think it's exactly the same thing. So it's, the, that was really the question about the internal as opposed to having the, uh, you know, transfer to another country. So one would really have to compare carefully to see whether the, that kind of, uh, now the specific legislation in the, what is it, yeah. it was the UK and the- um, um, In France, yeah. France, exactly, I suppose. So we don't have time here for yeah. this, but one would have to have really careful examination to see, you know, does this really somehow, can one complain or not, so. Yeah. Maybe that's the main answer. Okay. Yeah, no, it's all the devil's in the detail. We're all good lawyers, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so so when it comes to rule of law, let's turn let's turn to the rule of law now. Um, do you think that there will be a change given that we have a new administration in how the EU can deal with internal rule of law issues? Um, as w from within the member states in the proceedings against Hungary and Poland. Mm -hmm. Will there be a different dynamic now, um, given that we have a US new, new US administration? Um, do you think there'll be cooperation, as you said, with the Magnitsky Act and the mm -hmm. EU internal on rule of law violators in Russia or elsewhere? Um, is, there, is there a prospect yeah. for that? I suppose so. I, I mean, definitely everyone is going to be looking at, you know, the other, that, that is obviously clear. I mean, it really, sanctions make sense if they're as general and as broad as possible. Uh, it makes no sense, for example, for, I mean, it makes sense, it makes some sense, but it's less strong, less forceful. Any travel ban, for example, it's less forceful. You just, you know, block the US, but people can steal to Europe and, and the other way around. So certainly I'm sure that this will be very much looked at. The good thing is that now we also have a legal basis in the union for sort of a horizontal uh, imposition of sanctions of this kind, but which is, I mean, this is just as the framework is somewhat broader, but I should note the, the foreign policy sanctions have existed for a while. Actually, much of the European law, actually, especially uh, academic enthusiasm for European law actually has, has been based on the, um, on the story of sanctions. You, you remember, for example, the Cardi judgment. Yeah. Uh, the, the 2008 actually discussed exactly this problem of, for example, United Nations sanctions in the era of, of, of terrorism. And uh, it was, again, one of the precise questions was, you know, should there be, you know, the, the, the people who are named on the UN Security Council Committee just automatically be sanctions in the Union and whether there should be some judicial review or not. So um, this, both foreign policy and anti-terrorist sanctions, and they're the two main kinds, they have been, uh, you know, enforced and used for for a long, quite a long, many years now. It's just that now we're going to have a more comprehensive, a clearer framework about, you know, which are the criteria which are listed in the. There's a, there's a regulation and there is the decision, and in both of them there is the same criteria are actually provided to say, you know, what constitutes, uh, for example, a, a serious human rights violation. So it can also include, by the way, you know, infringement of let's say free speech or free assembly, religious rights under certain conditions. So it's, it's worded rather broadly, um, but that is the, um, that's just kind of the, the idea is really to provide a general legal basis. And on that basis, then the commission and the council, uh, unfortunately, parliament is not involved in this, but uh, it, it will give its own opinion, but it will not have a vote. 
uh, then the the, um, the the particular persons who are concerned uh, will be will be put on the list, uh, and I'm sure that the, there will be permanent uh, contacts with the U.S. on this. Uh, so we're now kind of catching up on that area. This, I guess. Very interesting. Um, actually, I, I see that Dean Solorio has a couple of questions. Would you like to ask them yourself, uh, Dean Solorio? I'll put myself on. Thank you so much for your remarks, Andres. This has been really interesting. So I have two questions. Sure. And they're, they're in some ways directly, but in some ways indirectly related to the relationship with the United States. I mean, a lot of it is also what's happening at the European Union right now and its relationship with the Council of Europe. So one question is, in your perspective, how do you see the process of accession of the EU uh, to the European Convention on Human Rights? I mean, what do you think are the advantages? What do you think are the challenges? I mean, that's one question. And then the second question was really about Brexit and what you perceive as the impact on the European Union, but also its potential impact on the Council of Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Jose. I mean, those are great questions. And particularly the accession, and I actually have a sort of kind of a personal personal view on that because I, I was a staffer in the Strasbourg court for just over a year. And I should say that, uh, you know, I, I find it amazing. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of the Strasbourg court. And I don't agree with all the decisions, but I, I, I had this privilege of actually working there. And, uh, and, uh, and I find it just, you know, fascinating because there's lots of dedicated staffers really reviewing, you know, whatever, anybody can just write, anybody just complains. Sometimes you get, you know, interim measures, you can get urgent cases, you can get really, I think it's an enormous privilege to be able to know and to be able to have some kind of legal remedy, irrespective of where you live, what your position is, you're in prison, uh, you're, you're, you're waiting for, you know, court decisions too long. Refugees, for instance, again, an asylum seeker is a major category that's concerned. And, and I can just assure you that that is really the, you know, the, the, the European human rights system is really amazing. Uh, I would very much <laughs> encourage everybody to try to follow this uh, with all the problems of, you know, one can discuss whether the individual decisions, uh, you know, are right or not, whether they were reasoned and so on. As to whether the union should join, this is then the big problem. Uh, there, there's enormous logistical and practical problems. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the court just to say that it's obviously everybody agrees in a way that we should the union should join in fact the treaty requires uh, the european union treaty requires the union to join the the uh, however uh, the two systems of protection so the european court in strasbourg council of europe and the, the european courts in luxembourg under the union are actually completely different in terms of structure and procedures um, this creates an almost insurmountable problem because if you want to tie them up together, so where are the, you know, how are the remedies going to be designed? Who will be able to lodge and who, who will ask? And the, um, you will certainly recall the, the very famous opinion 213 of the Court of Justice, which was asked about this. Uh, well, it was asked specifically about the, the accession agreement that the, the union had negotiated. And it, it came to the conclusion, well, it is just not good enough because there is not the role of the Court of Justice to, to be able to rule itself. And that is especially because the, the union itself has a charter of fundamental rights. It has its own human rights charter, which is more extensive. And so it would seem normal or sensible that of course the Court of Justice itself would be ruling first on human rights violations. So practically you don't have a problem when you have internal EU cases. So for example, in competition or staff cases, which start, let's say as decisions of the, of the commission or other agency, and then go to the first, you have the general court, you have then the court of justice. There'll be no problem technically saying, well, you can now go to the court of Strasbourg. But the real problem rises, well, what about the member state? Because most European Union law is actually implemented by the member states. So you will need to have uh, first a preliminary ruling coming back and then potentially going to Strasbourg. And this was the problem in the very famous Bosporus case where you had actually two different rulings on the same issue uh, just because the proceedings were different. So I, 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 don't, I don't know, I know this, is, this has been a while now, so 2013, what was it? The decision was 2015. I'm not aware that um, if there was any attempts going on now to try to renegotiate that agreement. But it is a legal obligation. At some point, there will have to be some kind of solution found in order to, to, to try to coordinate both systems. So how to satisfy the requirements of the Court of Justice about its own role and at the same time make it possible to actually we have to renegotiate it anyway, because um, you know, this is you know, the Council of Europe has what is it, 47 member states. 
including the UK. And here I come to the to your next question because the um, the, the UK remains a member of the uh, Council of Europe, uh, remains subject to the rules of the Human Rights Court. And interestingly, as a matter of fact, during the many, I would say, decade more prior to to actual Brexit, much of the criticism of sort of the European integration has actually been directed at the Human Rights Court. Uh, rather than the court in Luxembourg, if you recall, maybe the decisions on prisoner voting rights, for example, that's been a major issue that has, for political and other reasons, created a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, criticism in, in the UK. And actually, some of the more critical voices on the, the work of the Human Rights Court uh, uh, actually do come from the UK. And I actually taken them up in my book. So, <laughs> and so Francesco is very right to point out that my, my, my work is, I would say, constructively critical, but it is critical. There are actually are, I think, very good questions about the you know, jurisprudence and what criteria should be used. It's a very legitimate, perhaps, you know, discussion. I think it's an area which really could be explored more. But I do remember I, I've really drawn a lot from the criticism that has actually come from the UK to try to see. I think there are many points which are quite fair. Um, unfortunately, this became then a bit conflated. The whole discussion, Brexit, whether this is, you know, has to do with Europe, European Union accession, that's quite different. And uh, in, in terms of the Brexit, how this will affect us the, um, on, on the union side, uh, I mean, nobody's happy with Brexit. This is, this is normal. Nobody's happy with, with, with one member state leaving, especially UK, because it has made a valuable contribution in almost every aspect of the union. As a matter of fact, has voted together with other member states in the vast majority of, of, of legislative proposals. There just seem to be no particular indication that it would be somehow fundamentally opposed to, to the legislation that's being proposed. In fact, it's a major contributor to the quality of the European legislation because you have different points of view, a different legal system, and you know, that is always good to have to, um, to, to try to you know, exchange points of view uh, in many areas. Um, there will be um, um, many, many areas where there will have to be practical changes. Imagine, for example, the, um, what is it, the, uh, so the um, private international law, so the Brussels regulation system. That's a major area that would have to essentially the, the, the regulation doesn't apply anymore to the UK. Uh, there would have to be. A, I've just seen actually uh, in Parliament on the on the one of the next meetings. There's a security cooperation agreement that is being discussed now. Um, there is then uh, the all the arrangements that have to be um, done in order to put the whole Brexit agreement into place. So not just with rules of origin, literally physically how how you let goods into, but also in terms of services. Again, that's a major issue for the UK, especially for the financial sector. So a lot remains to be seen. Um, but for the union itself, it, it, in the other, other than the fact that it's, of course, now changes a little bit the dynamic, of course, because it's a major state, it also changes a bit the financing because it is a major contributor. Of course, it's not, it's a change, but it doesn't change. Um, it has not brought about any major revolution or anything like that. And there's been a bit of a speculation at the time of the, dis the discussions well, you know, there's going to, everything is going to fall apart if the UK leaves or there's going to be other member states joining. That hasn't happened. All the other member states have, you know, stick together. No, there is no discussion of any other member state leaving. Uh, there is no, um, you know, the, the, there are obviously problems. There is obviously now resources have to be found elsewhere for the, the same budgetary goals. Um, but the unit just continues. So there is no, there is no sign that that will have fundamentally changed or, um, reoriented the, the public debate. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the European Parliament elections that last we had, we had the highest turnout. So we had more than 50% turnout really now, um, uh, which has uh, been for the first time an increase in improvement. So at least it seems that the public uh, in Europe, the citizens recognize that there is, uh, you know, that there, there is value to the union. There, there is no, 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 no major attempt or no major effort that I would see that would try to, you know, repeat the experience of the UK. Thank you, and, and also thank you, Professor Bignami, for moderating this event. Oh, yeah, so I see we have maybe five minutes here. Um, I wanted to see, um, Andrew, do you have any uh, parting thoughts you want to give us? Or... Yeah, well, um, first of all, thanks for having me. I mean, it's really, I, I'm really uh, so happy to, you know, hear the questions, you know, what's most interesting, you know, what, what, what questions maybe we should, you know, look at. It also helps me because sort of it's my job to try to, um, you know, to converse and to, to engage also with the, uh, especially with universities also here in the US, which uh, I have also a very emotional attachment to because I studied here a long time ago. So I'm a, 
big admirer of the um, of the U.S., especially the um, academia and, uh, and especially its academic and the think tanks. And uh, and I should say that's actually one of the areas where you know Europeans would benefit. If I'd say it's it's sort, of, it's, it's sort of been in between the lines, always a little bit suggested that we should you know learn from the U.S. in terms of technology and in terms of the university structures. And I'm the first one to to support that idea. I would very much like. For example, to have a, a you know leading um, technology or academic institutions of that kind of that caliber also being uh, set up uh, in Europe and you know get you know experts or tech, you know um, academics and, and engineers from everywhere to be able to you know work in the same way as the U.S. has done because at the end of the day one has to be you know and I think we all learn from each other and you know definitely one has to ask you know why why are the digital giants why are they based in California they could be based in Toscana for example no there is a, that's a perfect place I think to put some digital companies I would I would recommend so uh, I, I think this exercise question of mutual learning uh, mutual uh, kind of uh, you know understanding I see a lot of lots of misunderstandings here in the US there's also lots of misunderstanding back home so my parting thought would be you know Try to uh, let's try to I say kind of learn from each other and try to uh, you know um, see where where best we can find a common ground. Uh, I'm I'm basically quite positive, rather optimistic. I think now the with all the um, there's been many let's say dark thoughts and very difficult events, uh, uh, not just in Europe but also now here in the U.S. Uh, things that have surprised everybody. The the European public has follow, has followed very closely um, the, the election period here in the US. It, I think that's one of the interesting developments. I've never actually seen uh, so much interest for US politics as, as this as last year. I, I, literally, I mean, the, the when I went to in January, I just went to the, um, was it, a, I think my mechanic, and he, he just said, oh, but you're in the US, you know, how about this thing with the capital and so on. So like really, people on the street would actually, you know, really watch with amazement and have this interest in trying to understand, you know, so what is this whole certification procedure? And, and I had to explain a lot, how does the electoral college process work? So I find it a very positive development that I see more and more interest people in, in Europe interested in US and US, you know, US law, US politics, uh, also the, and at the same time, I also see more interest for Europe. So that is my general optimistic note. I hope that we, you know, I have quite a bit of time here left in the in the US, so I, I hope to be able to uh, you know to, to do as much as possible. But uh, most of all, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me, and also to have, if you have any questions, I, I'm available for any qualification. I mean, we have this. We'll have a lot of discussion, I think, on, on the Services Act, on the Markets Act. So feel free to don't hesitate just to contact me if I can be of any assistance. Uh, you know, it's my job to do so. So, and thanks again uh, for having me. Thank, thank you so much. It was really fascinating and it was a very illuminating presentation on where we'll be going in the next four plus years. And I have to say, it's also nice to be able to end on an optimistic note because uh, the past several years have been colored by gray pessimism and the fact that we are now virtual like this also tends to give that gray coloring to everything. But it's good to note these different avenues for you know, positive developments on all these different fronts. Um, so, so really, it was a really real pleasure to um, listen to your comments. And I, I very much hope we'll be able to do it again during your tenure at the sure. European Parliament's office sure. here. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Francesca. Good, so we'll conclude there, I think, and hope everybody has a good afternoon and watch this page because there's a lot going on in both places. So, Perfect. terrific. Bye, everybody. All right, thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks so much. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.